Thank you and good morning all. It's time for a question period. The member for Nepean called. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Uh, Minister, good morning. On Monday, you released uh, a 33 to 50 percent rate hike on Ontario families and uh, small businesses. Uh, when I asked you two days ago what that impact would have uh, from the gas plant scandal in Mississauga and Oakville, you said it hadn't been included yet. Then after the question period, you had to retract that statement and correct your record. What is clear is that this government doesn't know what its energy policy actually means to the people across this province. That's why earlier today I put forward a substantial motion asking your government uh, to go back one year to provide us all documents with respect to the gas plant cancellation and its impact on the ratepayer base as it is seen Question. in the long-term energy plan. Question is simple. Will you cooperate with the committee to ensure those documents are in our hands within six weeks from today? Mm -hmm. Sit down, please. The Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member for Nepean Carlton is on another wish hunt. W I S H, Mr. Speaker. Uh, wow. She's wishing that her imaginations come true. It's the Christmas. information that was provided in committee and provided to the Auditor General was quite clear, and she chooses to misconstrue it. Now, oh. misconstrue is not unparliamentary, Mr. Speaker. No, it's not. Because I actually looked it up in the dictionary. Terrific. And the uh, the word misconstrue means to fail to understand the true or actual meaning. Oh. Mr. Speaker, and there are a number of synonyms. The other synonyms are to misapprehend. Wow. To misconstrue, yes. to misinterpret, right. to misknow, wow. to misperceive, wow. to misread, to miss or a mistake. I would choose the word mistake because the chair of the OPA was at committee and he prepared, uh, showed the calculations Send it over on the to the speaker, and they actually amount to one to two dollars per year over 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Whoa. She doesn't want to admit Whoa. it. She chooses to misconstrue it, Thank and you. she wants to obfuscate the truth. I'll ask the minister to withdraw. Obfuscate the truth. Yeah, I withdraw. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Speaker, it is very clear that the minister still doesn't understand the implications of his long-term energy act and its cost on the rate base of this province. He doesn't seem to understand that it is a job killer. He doesn't understand that he actually has to respond to this assembly, and that is why we put forward a very sensible, substantive motion to prove to the ratepayers of Ontario that that government stole one billion dollars of their money. I would ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. Minister? Outside. Sometimes the best defense is a good offense, Mr. Speaker, and we're seeing a tremendous offense here from the critic. What she's trying to not talk about is a comment of her leader from a couple of days ago. That was interesting. When the leader of the opposition was asked if he could promise lower electricity rates, he said, the answer is no on that. Oh. So I would like to know what your policy is on rates. How high will you let rates go? He's very, very clearly on the record. And Mr. Speaker, it wasn't only the leader of the opposition. It was the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the uh, next supplementary, uh, I'm going to provide some other useful information for the public. Oh, Thank very you. good. Thank you. The, listen, the problem is the credibility. There's a massive gap between this minister, what he says, and actual fact. He's the only minister of energy in the province's history who has said. Top the clock. All of you are making it most difficult. I have to hear the question and I will try to hear the answer. 
and we're not doing very good for a Thursday. Question. Mr. Speaker, it is very hard to try and, and, and to speak over the callers of the Liberal Party because of their credibility, the credibility that they have lost. They have mismanaged $1.1 billion of people's money in this province. They chose to do that. I would ask you to withdraw again. Mismanaged. Withdrawn. Minister, you don't know your own energy plan. You don't know where the $1.1 billion went. You don't know where the 300,000 jobs went. You've made a mess of this file. Will you commit to the committee to work with them to ensure we get the facts, not constant contradictions from you and all of your bureaucrats? Will you commit to that today so I have that information in my hands in the next six weeks? Yes or no? The Minister of Environment, come to order. Is this quiet enough? Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's look at some facts. Sorry, I was wrong. Uh, according to the National Energy Board, Mr. Stop the clock. I could stand here all morning. Minister. Mr. Speaker, according to the National Energy Board, uh, these are the price increases that are projected over the next 20 years for uh, five of the larger provinces. Uh, these are 20-year projections. Alberta, 3.7 per cent per year. BC, 3.0 per cent per year. That's 60 per cent over 20 years, Mr. Speaker. 60 per cent over 20 years. Manitoba, member for Nipissing, come to order. Quebec, 3.0 per cent. Again, that's 60 per cent over the member of Simcoe Gray comes to order. 3.3 per cent. Our long term energy over 20 years projects the cost increases to be 2.8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. We're better than all of those other provinces for the next 20 years, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member for Perry Sound, Ms. Coker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, it seems your government is uh, particularly good at writing press releases, but very lacking in following through on what they promise. When you proclaim, quote, thousands of jobs coming to Northern Ontario from a press release issued on May 9, 2012, with regard to the Ring of Fire, your government failed to deliver. It is clear now that there was no concrete plan to back up this empty promise. Only weeks ago, you rushed to announce uh, that a development corporation had been established. I don't disagree with the concept, although you've been talking about the Ring of Fire for years in throne speeches, budgets, and economic updates. So, Acting Premier, if you're really serious about creating jobs, shouldn't your government have created this development corporation four years ago? Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I appreciate the question because it speaks about something critical to the province of Ontario and, for that matter, to all of Canada. The Ring of Fire and the development of the chromite deposits in the largest of the world come to order. is critical to the livelihood of every Canadian, not just Ontarians. And we have taken actions that we have put forward. The, the, the development corporation, as well as put forward a number of stakeholders, partnering the with member Aboriginal for Renfrew, First Nipissing, 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 as well as the Métis Nation, to ensure that we have access to these chromite deposits. A number of proponents are interested, and we'll continue to work with them. The we need all forms of government to on board to make this happen, Mr. Speaker. It's one of the reasons the Premier is now in Ottawa. Thank you. Supplementary. And you've made a mess of it, you Acting Premier. Well, so far, you've failed miserably on the Ring of Fire. Acting Premier, your lack of answers on the Development Corporation is troubling, so it does appear to be yet another empty press release. And before you go looking for money from the federal government, don't you think you should have a plan of your own? A transportation link for the Ring of Fire is critical to the success of the project and for the First Nation communities in the area. So now that Cliffs has pulled the plug on the Ring of Fire, well, uh, are you talking with other miners in the region, including Noront, who has their proposed east-west connection? Deputy Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, as noted, 
The province of Ontario has been taking leadership on the issues around developing the Ring of Fire for some years now. We recognize the importance of this development for all of Canada. And we, may, we must make note, the member opposite feels it's not necessary to engage the federal government on this critically important issue. It should, they should be at the table from the start, and they have not. In fact, I find, it, 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 I find that it's all but passing strange that infrastructure projects on a national level are made in British Columbia, they're made in the Northwest Transmission Line of British Columbia, they're made in the Lower Churchill Hydroelectric Project in Labrador, they're made in Alberta, and they haven't been made in Ontario. It is critical that we get all orders of government on board. Ontario has been the only level of government that's taken that Answer. leadership. We will continue to do so, and it's why, Mr. Speaker, so many other proponents are still interested in making that development happen. Supplementary. I didn't say you should engage the federal government. I said you should have a plan before you engage the federal government. We know the Premier is in Ottawa today meeting with the Prime Minister, and we know you like to blame the federal government for your failures, but it's your government that is sending all the wrong signals. Mining companies are suing your government. In fact, uh, one is currently in court for over $100 million for not fulfilling your duties. Acting Premier, thousands of potential jobs are at stake. We have cleared the decks here in this legislature. You've had plenty of time to work on this. When are you going to get your act together and show us your jobs plan for the Ring of Fire? Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, they have cleared the deck. They've completely cleared themselves of any uh, plan whatsoever. In fact, over the course of what they've discussed has been a very regressive system. Nature of the Conservative Party on that side of the House. You have not put forward a positive plan to support jobs in our province. We will continue to invest in the skills of our people to promote the Ring of Fire. We'll continue to invest in infrastructure projects to enable projects like the Ring of Fire to come to fruition. We're investing while you're suggesting we should make cuts all across the board. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we know when we speak to other, oper other stakeholders and, and so forth, they make note of the fact that Ontario is an attractive place to invest because of Answer. the investments that we're making in our future and because of the way we're stimulating economic growth and attracting that investment to Ontario, including the Ring of Fire. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the acting premier. People in Ontario haven't seen a raise in years, but electricity bills are going up by 40 percent to pay for growing private power deals. People are telling us that they think the Premier just doesn't get it. Can the Acting Premier explain to people why the Liberal government is more interested in their own political power than in getting power bills under control? Deputy Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, it, 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 the province, is, it's necessary to invest in transmission, it's necessary to invest in our electricity integrity, and it's something that has been neglected and was neglected for many years. Fortunately, our government has now built well over 20 new power plants in this province. We will continue to invest in infrastructure to support that integrity in our electricity system to maintain our competitiveness in future. And that requires a mix of all products. And Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite makes claims about the pricing. That's exactly why we need to have a long-term solution provided by the Minister of Energy to support that competitiveness in the future, which is now as competitive as any of the Great Lakes states and other provinces Very in this correct. province. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, liberal power schemes have padded the profit margins of private interests and left people and businesses in this province with the bill. Whether it's the $150 million that people are paying to U.S. hedge funds for the Mississauga gas plant cancellation or the hundreds of millions wasted on the Oakville gas plant, the fact is the private power interests are watching the checks roll in while people are worried about the bills rolling in. Can the Acting Premier explain why the Liberal government doesn't seem to care that people are worried about making ends meet? Mr. Speaker, we've taken a number of steps to support consumers by providing the clean energy benefit. We've taken steps to provide clean energy in this province. As a result, the member opposite has yet to show us their plan. 
In fact, they have, they have no denied any support for nuclear. They, they are, they are they're opposed to refurbishing of 50 percent of our base supply as it stands now. They haven't supported the green energy initiatives to provide for another 30,000 more jobs, not to mention cleaner energy. And they have yet to decide how it is they want to provoke and, and, and provide for that integrity because we need to invest in infrastructure and distribution. And they have also opposed those initiatives. Mr. Speaker, those are critical for our long-term competitiveness and to ensure that that both consumers and industry have reliability of power in our province. That's a great answer. Speaker, the Minister of Energy said it's just a fact of life that the bills keep going up. The fact of life is that people can't afford the bills that keep going up. Every month when people open their power bill, they're feeling squeezed, and no matter what they do, the bills keep getting bigger and bigger. Does the Liberal government not get how important this is to the people, or do they simply not care, Speaker? Deputy Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, the, the NDP are, are, are supporting and promoting the elimination of private investment in our province, and that's essential for uh, Ontario and, and for our competitiveness, and that would create thousands of jobs, Mr. Speaker. They want instead to create an energy super bureaucracy, Mr. Wow. Speaker. That, is, that doesn't encourage investment in Ontario. And in fact, it's Ontario's hybrid system, a mix of both publicly owned and private investments that help drive our economy, create tens of thousands of jobs for Ontarians. And we must always consider the implications of creating jobs in our province, and that's what this is about. And, Mr. Speaker, maintaining competitiveness and reliability is essential, not for just consumers, but for industry. And in fact, quote here from the Canadian Automotive Partnership Council, the highest Answer. priority for large industrial consumers is access to reliable electricity infrastructure, something Ontario didn't have during the brownout era of Mike Harris as well. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the leader of the third party. For the acting Premier, Speaker. Every time the Liberals had a chance to get the hydro bills under control, they chose to help out private power companies instead. After 90 the member of the gas Gray come to order. the Premier couldn't explain why she signed an arbitration agreement that the Auditor General said gave the upper hand to TransCanada. When the Premier had a chance to get a better deal for Ontarians, she chose to be a good Liberal and not rock the boat. Does the Liberal government even care that the Premier helped TransCanada get the upper hand over Ontario families? Deputy. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Energy. we have three priorities that are equal priorities in managing the energy system. One is reliability, two is clean, three is affordable. We spent $31 billion over 10 years making it reliable from deficit to surplus and making it clean from dirty coal to clean energy. Mr. Speaker, there are pressures on prices as a result of that $31 billion of investment. But what we have done to transition, Mr. Speaker, is create some support for the people of Ontario by creating the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, 10 percent discount, the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit saving qualifying individuals up to $963 per year, with a maximum of $1,000 per year for qualifying seniors. The Northern Ontario Energy Credit, Mr. Speaker. The Low Income Energy Assistance Program. Save on Energy Home Assistance Program. That party voted for some of these supports yes, for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They should be ashamed of themselves. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, you know, talking points simply don't help people pay the bills. With this government, instead of asking whether there's a business case for nuclear refurbishments that's worth millions and millions of dollars, billions in fact, the government instead has a long-term energy plan that makes it clear that they're blindly charging ahead no matter what the cost is going to be. Does the acting premier even care or is he even interested in how much this is going to cost Ontarians? Acting premier. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I answered this question yesterday to her critic. She wants us to tell the public what it's going to cost for the first stage the of the member for Oxford come before to order. we've entered into the procurement. We're going to tell all the bidders what our estimate of the cost is. will totally destroy the competition on the, the price member for Bruce it's Gray totally and son come to order. The question is premised on an irresponsible idea to tell the world what the cost is going to be before the, before the procurement. Won't 
do it. We won't do it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal Power Plan should be called the Liberal Political Power Plan. Absolutely. When the Liberals realized that they could get a good deal on the Oakville plant, but it would have to be in the news, or they could spend hundreds of millions more and uh, get it done on the QT, what did they choose? They chose the expensive route that helped them politically. When the Premier wants to make uh, splashy announcements to help their friends in private nuclear, who just happened to throw a $100,000 fundraiser for them, all of a sudden, Ontario is plunging into a nuclear refurbishment without even knowing what the final price tag is going to be. Will the Acting Premier admit that the long-term energy plan is, in fact, just a Liberal political power plan? Acting Premier. Scout, sir, Mr. Speaker, so refurbishment is going to generate 25,000 jobs, you did jobs, both from Bruce, which is a private company, and from OPG, which is a public Darlington. company. We have a hybrid system that works extremely well. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the NDP want to create an energy super bureaucracy instead of encouraging competitive investment in the economy in Ontario. The fact is that Ontario has a hybrid system, a mix of both publicly owned generation and private investments that drive our economy. Does the leader of the third party know the job structure, creation structure from refurbishment? No. As I asked you on the Thunder Bay question, do you have any evidence? You don't have any evidence, you don't have any research to back up your Anything. questions. Please come forward with a plan. Tell us what your plan is. The member for York Simcoe North. Simcoe North, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm. Uh, my question is for my my colleague, the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister, you have said over and over again that a major part of the job of the Ontario College of Trades is consumer protection. Yeah. If that is so, can you explain to me why College of Trades enforcement cops would be investigating a complaint? on who is responsible to unload pipe off a truck at a construction site? <laughs> Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question from the member opposite. And I also understand the fact that, look, he, he never supported the College of Trades when we brought it in. And I expect that uh, it's going to be hard to convince him to support it now. But Mr. Speaker, every time an enforcement officer goes out there to ensure that our tradespeople's professions are being respected, preserved from that underground economy, we can't have this member coming at us every single time. Mr. Speaker, we know that you don't support consumer protection that the College of Trades is bringing to ensure that consumers, when they hire somebody to do a, a job that requires skilled trades, Mr. Speaker, know that that person's qualified. We know that you don't support the skilled trades uh, sector taking a self-governance approach and governing themselves. For some reason, you don't think skilled trades people are as qualified yes, as sir. other of the 44 regulatory bodies across the province. So, Mr. Speaker, we know where the member's coming from. We know at every turn he's going to try to, to discredit the College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, they're doing a good job. They're out there doing the job they're supposed to be doing to ensure that we have a vibrant skilled trades sector and to ensure that consumer... Thank you. Well, that, that was quite an answer. Uh, so, Minister, I have a letter here from Leona Local 1089 to Bob Onichuk, Director of Regulation Enforcement, in which he explains that two Ontario College of Trades enforcement officials have nothing better to do than investigate a complaint by UA Local 663 about Leona, and I quote, on whose job it is to unload pipe on the construction site. Is this for real? Are we kidding here? Every day another horror story comes to my office about the Ontario College of Trades. This nonsense does not protect the public or protect the trades in any way, shape or form. It is simply, Mr. Speaker, a waste of taxpayers' money, and the membership money is nothing but a bloody tax grab. How long are you going to stand by and put up with this nonsense? It is out of control, and a moratorium should be should be placed on further action until after we abolish it, when you have the courage Question. to call an election. Yeah. 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 Sit down, please. 
The Minister of Training Colleges and University. Speaker, my question is, how long is the member going to rail against an organization that's cracking down on the underground economy? How long is the member, Mr. Speaker, going to rail against an organization that's reduced ratios between apprentices and journey persons, Mr. Speaker, by 14, when his government, when they were in power, did zero reductions in ratios? They're proving their worth, Mr. Speaker. How long is this member going to rail against the, the fact that skilled trade workers, Mr. Speaker, in the sector have the right, the opportunity, and the wisdom to govern themselves a heck of a lot better than that sector was governed when his party was in power. Mr. Speaker, this party continues to attack organized labor. We see it in their right-to-work uh, approach, Mr. Speaker. We're gonna, they're they're going to reduce wages for everyday, ordinary, skills people and all Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, and union jobs. We take a different approach, Mr. Speaker. And, sir, we're going to continue to rebuild our economy. We're continue to port, support skilled trade workers, and we're continue to support, Mr. Speaker, unionized workers that are working really you. hard to build that strong economy. New question. The member for Nickel Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. In 2011, the Minister of Health asked the Ministry of Finance to conduct a forensic audit at Orange. We know that this audit found serious financial irregularity and significant discrepancy in terms of Dr. Mazza reported in actual pay. The Minister of Health decided not to read the report. Did the Minister of Finance take the time to read the forensic audit of Orange. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, it's uh, it's critical that, um, and and I applaud the Minister of Health for taking the initiative to to order this forensic audit the moment she was aware of some of uh, the discretions that were occurring. She immediately did so. She brought forward the forensic audit. Finance went in there, as well as some of the officials, to do the controls and found some of the and that was sent to the OPP, and those initiatives are underway, and we will certainly make every effort to provide uh, as much information as possible to the OPP to enable them with that investigation to go forward. And that is what has been taking place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I'll take it that means that he did not read the report, yet he is responsible for ma managing the financial affair of our province. The minister is also responsible for the Sunshine List, and his ministry's audit found that Dr. Maza's salary was actually three times higher than what was reported on the Sunshine List. Oh, wow. The serious financial irregularity at Orange continued to astound us all, and it cast a doubt on the integrity of all financial disclosures. Can the minister tell us why, like his Minister of Health, he did not want to know just how much money Dr. Mazza was making, why he was not interested in learning from the financial wrongdoing of Orange, and why he is not interested in making sure that it never happens again. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, that's, that's the farthest thing from the truth. The moment we found out what was happening at Orange, the moment those eight, that agency went rogue in effect, we went in, we clamped down, we took corrective action, we, the, the Minister of Health completely removed the board, we removed Mr. Mazza, Dr. Mazza from his role, and we provided proper oversight. And subsequently to that, we've actually implemented greater measures of transparency and accountability and oversight on all agencies, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do that. We must make clear that the issue before us was unique and, and, and his actions uh, is the reasons why the OPP and the police are investigating, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue to be as open and as transparent and provide the proper oversight on all broader public sector to ensure these initiatives and these issues never happen again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Scarborough Railroad. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. As a former University of Toronto Scarborough campus student and a proud representative of Scarborough Guildwood, a riding that neighbours on the UTSC campus, I know that flat tuition fees are a huge issue for students, and I've heard about this from many of my constituents. I also know, Speaker, from personal experience, not every student takes a full course load. 
Many take fewer courses to account for a part-time job or other personal circumstances. And yet many students across the province taking as little as two-thirds of a course load are currently charged the same tuition as a student taking a full course load. Speaker, this is an issue that student leaders have been raising for some time and is an essential issue of fairness for our students and their families. We must do everything we can to make post-secondary education more accessible and affordable Question. for them. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the government doing about this ongoing issue of flat tuition fees? Thank you, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for her question, but most of all for her inspired choice of schools. I'm a UTSC grad myself. I, I agree that, that fairness for students should be top priority for this government. I've often said, and we've often said, Mr. Speaker, that we must see our post-secondary system through the eyes of our students. That's exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we announced today that we're, we're moving Moving forward with our commitment to tackle flat fees for undergraduate students. This new policy will ensure university students across the province taking less than an 80 percent course load will be charged on a per credit basis. This will be fairer to students that, for whatever personal reason, choose to take less than 80 percent of a course load but are charged for that full course load. At the same time, universities that adopted a flat fee approach will need some time to adjust because there's a revenue impact for them. So we're going to give them about three years to face and this, sir. Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the student leaders that are here today. I want to thank student leaders that have brought this issue to our attention. We're pleased to respond on their behalf. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It's important to hear that this government is taking the initiative to tackle flat fee tuition billing in Ontario. This will make a difference in the lives of students in my riding and help make post-secondary education more affordable, making it possible for more young people to pursue post-secondary goals, like the students here from my riding and from West Hill Collegiate. But, Speaker, flat fees are not the only issue facing our post-secondary students when they pay their tuition fees each year. Many students are relying on financial assistance and they face de fee deferrals or late charges when their tuition fees are due prior to receiving their OSAP funding. Speaker, this just isn't fair to those students receiving financial assistance. Students are being hit with late charges when they have no control on when their Question. OSAP is received. Can the minister outline any actions he plans to take to address this unfairness? Minister. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that we announced early today as well that we're removing the unnecessary, this unnecessary burden to students across the province. In fact, we're making significant improvements to the process in which students pay for their tuition. Our new policies will ensure that all students will be able to pay tuition in per-term installments without paying deferral fees or interest charges. Tuition deposits will be capped and applied against tuition fees, not on top of fees owed. Uh, students' tuition fees will, will not be due before the beginning of August. And students receiving financial aid, and this is one of the important pieces, students receiving financial, financial aid will not be charged late fees and will not be expected to pay tuition until their OSAP assistance arrives. Mr. Speaker, we've listened carefully to students, and again, I want to acknowledge the voice that we've heard of our student leaders that are and here today and across the province. We've heard their voices. We've continued to respond to their concerns. And, Mr. Speaker, we're very, very pleased, and we should be proud of the input that they've had in public policy. Thank in you. This province. The member for Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Energy Minister this morning. The monthly hydro bill at Sigma Stretch Film in Belleville in January of 2011, that's about two and a half years ago, was $143,000. Today, the monthly hydro bill is $325,000. It's a company that employs 123 people in my riding. By the time, Minister, your 42% raise increase kicks in, the monthly hydro bill at Sigma is going to be $461,000 a month. That's an increase all thanks to the Liberal Energy Plan. Last month, your government gave Sigma a $237,000 grant, which will cover about half a month's hydro bill by 2017. Minister, the management at Sigma admits it's less expensive to do business in New Jersey than it is in Ontario. When is your government going to stop picking the pockets of Ontario businesses, admit that you've screwed up our electricity system so badly that we can't recover? Mr. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to deal with some facts. Ontario's industrial rates 
compare favorably with other jurisdictions. The member for Northumberland, Quinty West, your ward. Mr. Speaker, industrial rates in northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 44 American states. Industrial rates in southern Ontario are lower than in Alberta, Michigan, New Jersey, and California. Lower than New Jersey. We mentioned New Jersey, and in line with states like New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. And Mr. The Speaker, member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, your ward. As an example, for an industrial consumer with a demand of five megawatts per month, our 2010 LTP long-term energy plan had projected that in 2014 they would be paying $109 per megawatt hour. Under this current plan, Mr. Speaker, the Sir, would pay $87 per megawatt hour in 2014. That is a significant reduction, Mr. Speaker. They don't know the facts. They don't know the file. They are spinning the public, and these are the true facts that are, that are independent third parties. Supplementary. Minister. The Liberal wind turbines continue to spin, but nobody in Ontario is buying that Liberal spin. Yeah. Nobody in Ontario is buying that. Last week, you climbed up on your high horse. You told the Ontario people that it was their responsibility yeah. to understand why your government has turned the lowest hydro rates in North America into the highest in all of North America for months. Hydro One, and I've written you a letter on this, has been forcing Upper Canada Minerals. That's an employer of almost 30 people in the Madoc and Bancroft area in Centre and North Hastings to use what they call, Minister, dirty power made up of your intermittent power sources, your wind and solar. It's causing fluctuations in their power rates, and it's doing damage to their very expensive equipment and slowing down productivity. The problems occurring at Upper Canada Minerals show that your rhetoric about improving the hydro grid is nothing Thing but a liberal Question. illusion. Minister, after driving up rates and now having problems with the grid, when are you going to finally admit that you failed? Why don't you stand up today and resign? Yeah. Order. Stop the clock. The Minister of Environment and the, minister, and the member for Renfrew, Nipperson, Pembroke, come to order. And when I stand, you're supposed to stay quiet. <laughs> the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, and the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, maybe because of the noise you haven't heard me, you've both been warned. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I really want to refer this to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. <laughs> well, thank you, and I appreciate the referral. Mr. Speaker, I can't believe what I'm hearing from the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Who knows that last month I had the proud opportunity to visit Sigma Stretch Films, announcing a new investment from the Eastern Ontario Development. The Minister of Rural Affairs because he come to there order. At the company with me for the announcement, Mr. Speaker, and in fact it wasn't the first investment; it was the second investment that this government has made. And I can tell you that among manufacturers in the in the in the province that I've visited, this is one of the most successful, promising companies. And he doesn't have to take my word for it; he simply needs to talk. The, the member for Prince Edward Hastings who asked the question. They've gone from a company in just about 10 years, from eight employees up to now. I think they're about 120. Answer. They're doing fantastic. The export market is growing. It's a beautiful example of advanced manufacturing. I don't know where he gets his information, but he's definitely not talking to the same company that I visited just a few weeks ago. Stop the clock. The Minister of Rural Affairs, I've asked you to come to order more than once. The member for Timmins, James Bay. 
My question is to the Minister of Energy. List, Minister, across Northern Ontario, people are hopping mad in regards to what they're going to see their hydro bills increase by with the announcement you made on Monday in your long-term energy plan. It is not good news for citizens to hear that their hydro rates over the next three years are going to go up by 33 percent, and we're getting a lot of response. I've got this particular person, Andrea Heward, from North Bay, who writes, I am a homeowner. I work full-time, and I'm disabled. Electricity is very important in my day-to-day -day living. I have an electric wheelchair that has to be plugged in on a daily and nightly basis so I can go out to work the next day without having to worry about the battery. I'm paying $3,600 a year in hydro minimum, and I only make $32,000 a year, which means I'm paying more than 10 percent of my annual household income in hydro. She can't afford to pay her hydro bill, Minister, and you're raising the rates. How do you see that as being fair to Mrs. Heward in North Bay? Minister of Energy. As I've said earlier, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have made very significant investments in the system in order that it be reliable uh, and that it be Manitoba clean. And that put record. pressure on rates. As a result of that pressure, we took some transitional steps, Mr. Speaker. That includes the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, Good which one. takes 10 percent off the bottom line on the bill. The Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit. Good saves program. qualifying individuals up to $963 per year, probably applies to that person, with a maximum of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. Yes. The Northern Ontario Energy Credit saves families up to $210 per year and individuals up to $137 per year. Good In news. addition, we have the Low Income Energy Assistance Program and the Save on Energy Home Assistance Program. These are cumulative, Mr. Me Mr. Speaker. That particular Answer. Uh, electricity consumer Manitoba. can access all of these programs, and I assume she'll she it will be applied. Most of them will apply. We'll help her if she needs supplementary. Service. Well, Minister, I think this consumer knows very well how to apply, and that's including that that she's having to pay a high, uh, her hydro bill. I have another email here from Donald Bates from Thunder Bay, who says, "I've been living at my current address in Thunder Bay, Ontario, for the past 10 years. I have, over the past 10 years, purchased new appliances, all of which are energy efficient. I have installed energy efficient lights." Each year, my energy consumption has been going down. However, for years now, I've been, pre I've been preached by government to conserve, yet the more I conserve, the more I pay. So I say to you again, Minister, people across the North are hopping mad that they're, no matter what they do, no matter how they try to prepare themselves, no matter how much they try to conserve, their hydro rates have gone up, and now they're going to go up another 33 per cent. How do you square that off as being fair for people that need hydro on a day-to-day -day basis for their life? Minister. Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the announcement of the long-term energy plan several days ago uh, provided the opportunity for a lot of people to express their opinions on the plan. And one of the questions that was asked of both the leader of the third party and the leader of the opposition was, could you promise to lower electricity rates? And answer? the answer from both of them was no, no, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to know what the plan is. Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. The reality is that when you compare the rates uh, for a 20-year period uh, that are, have been, been uh, revealed by the National Energy Board, Alberta's 20-year projection is 3.7 percent. British Columbia, 3.0 percent. That's 60 percent over the 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Ontario's under this long-term energy plan over 20 years is a 2.8 percent average increase. That's an improvement and over sir, our plan from 2010, Mr. Speaker. It's progress. Plus, we have all those other support programs for members of the public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le ministre. Thank you. I have a question uh, to the Minister of Education. The quality, publicly funded education, including so many of Ontario's teachers who are here with us today. It was reassuring to witness earlier this week the passage of Bill 122, the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act, which passed second reading after 14 hours of debate. Speaker, as one of the earliest educational philosophers, Plato, said rather a long time ago, one of the measures of a society is the care it devotes to its youth. In that spirit, Speaker, the Wynne government has worked tirelessly and perseveringly to rebuild our commitment and relationships with our partners in the education communities. We all aspire to move forward with a common purpose to improve student achievement and ultimately build a more prosperous and just society. 
Speaker, can the minister please inform this chamber? Question. What are the next steps for moving this important piece of legislation through the parliamentary process? The Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for raising this important question. And I, too, was extremely pleased to have Bill 122, the School Board's Collective Bargaining Act, pass second reading this week. This is an important step forward in how we work with our partners in education, some of whom are joining us here today. And I know many of my colleagues, uh, MPPs, will be meeting with representatives from the Ontario Secondary School Teacher Federation today to talk about how we can all work together to build on the progress we have made in student achievement over the past 10 years. Part of this is ensuring that we provide the education sector with a clear process with defined roles for the parties as we approach the next round Answer. of collective bargaining. The next step is to send the Bill 122 to committee for public hearings and clause-by-clause -clause examination, and then hopefully back to the legislature for third reading. And I uh, look forward to support from members so we can get this important new collective bargaining scheme in place. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, on behalf of all the students and parents of my own riding of Etobicoke North, I'd like to commend the minister for his stewardship of this important file. In face-to-face -face meetings today, we'll hear from our partners in the education communities, not only about Bill 122, but of course other ideas, measures and initiatives to strengthen education in Ontario. Speaker, our government remains focused as the minister has declared repeatedly on student achievement. Ontario is already recognized around the world as having one of the best publicly funded education systems in the English-speaking world. Yet as always, Speaker, there is more work to be done. We continue to strive for the best for our students. Speaker, would the minister please inform this chamber what are the next measures she will adopt to further fortify education in Ontario? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And Speaker, today is an excellent opportunity to hear directly from our partners at OSSTF about their vision of, for the future of our education system here in Ontario. I've had the pleasure uh, over this last few months of traveling all around the province to uh, hear directly from Ontarians about what they think the future of education looks like to them. Education workers from all over the province have been part of that, have been very active participants in the consultation, and they've been there in person. They've provided digital and written and feedback. What we've heard is that we need to broaden our approach, our understanding of what does student success mean, and we need to provide engaging learning opportunities that develop the skills needed to actually and contribute to the 21st century economy and society. We look forward to releasing this new vision earlier in the new year. But as the member said, we have a lot to be proud of in creating with our partners a great education system. Now we need the opportunity Thank to you. make it an excellent system. The member for Port Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, acting premier. Speaker, the Liberal government made a short-sighted decision to close the slots at the Fort Erie racetrack. Yeah. And of course, we know this decision was enabled by the NDP when they abstained from the vote on the 2012 budget. Speaker, the Fort Erie Racetrack has put together a festival plan like the government's transition panel told them to. The festival will celebrate the Chinese New Year, the year of the horse. They submitted their plan to the Premier, the OLG, and the media last week. Minister, this proposal is, is time sensitive. If you don't want to answer them, Will you tell us today what your plan is? Absolutely. The Premier. Minister of Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the question from the member for Perth Wellington. And of course, as you know, our government put together a five year plan in place, $400 million under the direction of three former very distinguished cabinet ministers of the province of Ontario, the Honourable John Snowblum, the Honourable Albert Buchanan, and the Honourable John Wilkinson. So we depended on their good guidance, and I fear for the opposition. There's the five-point plan, the three-point plan, and their half-baked plan, but we have a five-year plan, $400 million. And Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what we're doing for Fort Erie. 
I'm encouraging that Fort Erie is continued discussions to develop a festival type race boat. Assistance is available to track operators to develop plans that include new ideas, new partnerships, and new sources of revenue. I understand that Fort Erie Live Racing Consortium has indicated that they will be applying Answer. for funding assistance from the Ministry of Agriculture and Food to hire an outside consultant to help them develop a solid race plan, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, obviously nothing is the answer. That's the answer. Minister, your, horse, your plan for horse racing has destroyed this proud industry. Absolutely. It hurt families at a time when they can least afford it. They're short on time. They need an answer by the second week of January to coincide with the Chinese New Year. Absolutely. We have a plan to save the horse racing industry, including the Ford Area Racetrack. Absolutely. It's a plan that will strengthen partnerships and create jobs yep. rather than destroy communities. Absolutely. Minister, what action will you take to save the Ford Area Racetrack? Minister. Well, thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. To paraphrase a former Prime Minister of Canada, Don Drummond, if necessary, but not necessarily Don Drummond. So when you looked at the Drummond report, the Drummond report said the SARS program was not accountable, not transparent, and poor public policy. Mr. Speaker, don't take my word for it. Take the word of a former colleague of theirs, the Honourable John Snowblin, who said the SARS program wasn't accountable, not transparent, poor public policy, need to be replaced. We've replaced that, Mr. Speaker, with a five-year, $400 million program, and I take no lessons from the opposition with their half-baked plan. Thank you. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the acting premier. This government has left the, for the horse racing industry in Fort Erie in critical condition. It left it with only one option to stay alive after it cancelled its main revenue source through the slots at racetrack program cancellation. That option was to come up with a plan for a seasonal festival. Well, the Fort Erie Racetrack has actually submitted a detailed Year of the Horse festival plan to the government. They need to know, however, by the end of the year if they're going to get funding so that they can actually get, go ahead with the planning of this festival. My question is a simple one, Speaker. When will the government respond to this proposal? Thank you. The Acting Premier. Minister of Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. Well, thanks uh, very Rural much, Affairs. Mr. Speaker. So excited to answer that question. I got up uh, a little early before my colleague, the Minister of Finance, but I just uh, responded to the member from Perth Wellington. We are in the process right now. We're encouraging the wonderful people of Fort Erie in their discussions to develop a festival tripe race speed. Assistance is available to track operators to develop plans that include new ideas, new partnerships, and new sources of revenue. I understand that the Fort Erie Live Racing Consortium has indicated it will be applying for funding assistance for the Ministry of Agriculture and Food to hire an outside consultant to help them develop a solid plan, Mr. Speaker. But I want to know from the third party, why did they stall the appointment of the Honourable Albert Buchanan, oh, a former very distinguished oh, agriculture oh, minister from 1990 to 1995, a great advocate, a member of the NDP with great distinction? Answer. But when they got his appointment for the committee, they turned him down, threw him under the bus, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, Speaker, my question is not about well-connected insiders. It's about the people of Fort Erie and their specialty track meets. Supporting the Fort Erie Racetrack's Year of the Horse Festival plan is the bare minimum first step to keep this racetrack open in the short term. For the long-term viability of the racetrack uh, uh, future is, in fact, the slots at racetrack program being reinstated. Obviously, that's something that uh, they're not interested in doing, but the Fort Erie track urgently needs an answer on this proposal, Speaker. The year of the horse in the Chinese calendar starts in late January with the Chinese New Year. Will this government announce its support for this proposal by the end of this month so that they can actually get to planning of the year of the horse festival meet at the Fort Erie Horse Racetrack? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I find it rather unusual that anybody in the third party will insult a former distinguished member of this uh, parliament, the Honourable Albert Buchanan, a gentleman who was considered 
one of the finest agricultural ministers in the province of Ontario, when they took the opportunity, they threw him under the bus. Shame, shame, shame. But let me tell you what we're doing for Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker. We're working with the Fort Erie Live Racing Commission. We've asked them to submit a plan. We were providing them for financial support uh, to get that plan in. And you know, when you talk about contradictions with the NDP, why did they accept $18,500 from Bruce Power at one of their fundraising events? Thank you. New question. The member. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, through, through you to the Attorney Stop the clock. The member from Ottawa will leave. Thank you again, Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Attorney General, I know that our government's decision in 2003 to regulate the paralegals has been extremely successful. I'm pleased to know that nearly 5,000 paralegals are licensed and insured in Ontario, providing consumers throughout the province with more choice and improved access to justice. I know that Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada that regulates paralegals. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell this House about the changes to the regulation of the paralegal industry, specifically the amendments to the rules of the Small Claims Court. Minister of the Attorney General. Question. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate the member's advocacy on behalf of the paralegals uh, in Ontario, Speaker. Uh, he's quite correct that our government's commitment to strengthen the paralegal profession has been ongoing since 2003. As a matter of fact, as he mentioned, there are 5,000 paralegals in the province now, and when the program first started in 2003, there were only 2,200. And the reason for that is, is that people need Repre uh, legal representation before administrative tribunals and before those bo bodies that paralegals can, uh, uh, can appear in front of. And that's why it's so important to pass the new law that we're bringing forward in a bill that's currently before the House that would amend the Law Society Act to increase the number of licensed, uh, licensed paralegals on the Board of Governors of the Law Society, namely convocation, from two to five to give and them sir. greater representation. It would also amend the Solicitors Act, uh, Speaker, to confirm that licensed paralegals can represent a person in a legal proceeding and receive payment for these services. And I'll you. continue with this in my supplementary. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the Attorney General for that answer. I'm happy to hear of our government's commitment to improving access to justice through the good work of paralegals. I know these changes have taken place through extensive consultations, but are also a demonstration of our government's taking action on recommendations that have been made and set out by the Law Society of Upper Canada. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the great work that has been done with amending rules of the Small Claims Court, could the Attorney General please comment on the work that has been done by our government to recognize the importance of paralegals in the court system. Attorney General. Well, the rule changes Good that question. are taking place within the Small Claims Court make it easier and more convenient for people to both submit claims as well as defenses to a uh, claim that may have been issued against them, Speaker. It's an online service that's available to everyone, uh, including, obviously, paralegals. Tell but, Speaker, more. what is truly, truly important is that this bill gets passed by December the 31st of this year, which is less than a month away right now. And the reason for that is, is that there's an election cycle for both benchers and paralegal benchers that will take place in March of next year. That election cycle only takes place every four years, and if we don't take the opportunity, and I know all the members in the House agree on this bill, so why don't we get on with it, pass the bill so that the elections can take place and that the paralegals will not, will not, will not have to wait another four years before their representation will increase from two to five. The people of Ontario have a right Answer. to proper legal representation, whether it's through paralegals or Pearl. through lawyers. Access to justice is the main issue facing the justice system thank you. today, Speaker. New question, the member for Durham. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Deputy Minister. Minister, aspirate is a medication used for the treatment of mild to moderate forms of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, Deputy Minister. referred to as IPF. It was approved by the Ministry of Health in Ottawa in 2012 based on scientific evidence, and yet these studies concluded that 
30,000 Canadian citizens are suffering with IPF, and the Canadian Pulmonary Foundation estimates that 5,000 patients in Ontario or in Canada will die this year. Patients like Byron Miles from Northumberland and Barb Skinner from Wellington Halton Hills, Virginia Curry from my riding of Durham, Hugh Detzler from Huron Bruce. Your government and the Ministry of Health have let these families down and left them suffering with IPF. Minister, governments in Europe and the UK publicly fund access Why to stand? aspirin to improve their lives. Minister, the EAP process is not working. Will you help or look into relieving the patients that are suffering with IPF in Ontario? Mr. You said you asked the question of the Deputy Minister. I want to make sure it's a Deputy Premier. Deputy? Yeah, I think we understood, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I recognize that Ontarians want to have access to new and effective drug therapies as quickly as possible. Our Ontario drug uh, program offers, as you may know, more than 3,800 drugs now. New drugs approved by the Use of Health Canada are first reviewed by the Canadian Drug Expert Committee. With regards to Esprit, the Canadian Drug Expert Committee recommended that Esprit should not be funded because of inconsistent results. It is then up to each province to decide whether they want to fund the drug, as the members now asking. We've established a process for approving drugs, an expert advisory committee that makes a recommendation based on the best available evidence. All brand name drugs that come forward for review are now also considered through the Pan Canadian Pricing Alliance. Given the concerns raised yes, by sir. the Canadian Drug Expert Committee, participating provinces and territories have decided not to engage in negotiations through the Pan Canadian process at this time. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, I don't thank you for the uh, answer because I don't think you're actually listening. These are families that are suffering with IPF, and you're not listening. Your EAP process does not work. Nope. A medical specialist in Toronto, Dr. Binney, from Toronto, strongly states that Esprit should be publicly funded in Ontario, as it is in other jurisdictions. Why are you denying the patients in Ontario access to a drug that is strongly recommended by experts? Your process is nothing but a block to access to health care in Ontario, and I'm asking you today to look at those studies and fund this for the people of Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's critical to, to appreciate the concerns that we all in this House share for families and those that are suffering. It is why we want to make certain that the proper drugs are being administered and are, are being approved by the experts who are providing it. And, Mr. Speaker, to the member's question, I am told that the Ministry of Health is gladly and appropriately reviewing any new evidence that may be, that, that's available to manufacturing this said uh, drug for submission. So we are taking the actions and the proper steps necessary to protect those families, ensure that everyone receives the proper care at Sir. the right time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member of Parkville High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for women's issues. Every six days, a woman in Canada is murdered by her current or former partner. Ontario shelters like Cornerstone are turning away more and more women and children every year because of lack of funding. In the first five months of this year alone at Cornerstone, a record number of 72 abused women have been turned away to potentially lethal results. Uh, so my question also is about Toronto's Victim Services, the only agency that provides immediate assistance to domestic violence victims. Their funding per victim has dropped from $286 in 1990 to $31 in 2010. Today, in acknowledging the 24th anniversary of the Montreal Massacre, this government will voice its concern, but how many more women have to die before this government acts? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I know that uh, the member opposite brings up a very important issue and one that's important to all of, the, all of us in this House, not only to myself as the minister and to our government as well. I will be rising later this afternoon in recognition of December 6 on the National Day of Remembrance, where we remember that day and what it means to us. We know that domestic violence is a serious issue, and we've done quite a bit on this side of the House, Speaker, over the last number of years. We introduced the Domestic Violence Action Plan. We've trained more than 28,000 frontline workers, wow. and in fact, there are thousands that go through our shelter system every year. Do we need to do more? I think we can all agree, Speaker, that we do. This is a very critical issue, one that we all think is a priority and one that we will continue to work on. Thank you. 
Thank you. The time for question period has expired. There being no deferred votes, this House stands adjourned until 1 p.m.